Hello, Worcester State. Uh, welcome back to 2017. Um, this is Socialist Alternative Radio uh, on WUS, WSUR. I'm Nick, special snowflake number one. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth, special snowflake numero de. And we're going to be talking about socialism. Yay! Yay. <laughs> all right, so if you listened to us at all uh, last semester... Um, you probably have a pretty good idea of who we are, what we do, stuff like that. But if you're you know, new this semester, you haven't heard us before, um, today we're kind of going to be talking about sort of some of the things that have been happening since uh, we uh, went off the air last semester for the break. Because um, I don't know if you've been keeping up, but a few things have happened yeah. uh, in the world and in the U.S. since then. And surprise, surprise, we have an opinion about them. So many opinions about so many events. Where to even start? I mean, um, if we want to start from, you know, even just things that are happening right now, today, and working our way backwards. Um, I think that's good. A couple hours ago, uh, Betsy DeVos, the proposed Secretary of Education, got confirmed. Surprise, surprise. This is what happens when you have two parties of big business who only care about profits. Um, if you look at her track record of uh, making profits off of education, she's done a great job. Uh, she basically, you know, single-handedly, uh, well, not single-handedly because she had the support of, you know, both parties, but she uh, is responsible for, you know, almost completely privatizing uh, Michigan education, um, really expanding the charter schools out there. Um, and actually, it, it was a tie in, in the Senate, and um, uh, Mike Pence had to break it. Of course, he, uh, you know, voted to appoint her. Uh, she's the same uh, person who thinks that we should have guns in schools to protect us from grizzly bears. Um, <laughs> there sure are a lot of those running around the streets in Worcester. Yeah, it's true. Um, uh, also, something happening, you know, across the world. Right now in Bulgaria. Romania. Romania, excuse me. Right now in Romania, there are huge protests going on right now against government corruption. Um, no Spe one's Specifically, uh, they were, the Romanian government was uh, introducing a new law that would um, decriminalize certain levels of embezzlement so you wouldn't actually get um, charged with a crime or a jail sentence or anything like that. You'd just get uh, a fine, which you could probably pay off with the embezzled money. Um, so I think in it's, what, 250,000 people were out yep. uh, in the streets of their capital. Yeah, biggest um, street protests since 1989. Right, 1989 is the year that Stalinism fell in, in Romania. And so that's a, that's a huge development. I mean, across the world, the, it seems like there's a trend towards... Um, this this kind of resistance uh in in britain right now there's huge pushback against the fact that um theresa may who is the current prime minister um is refusing to budge on extending a state visit to um uh president donald trump um and this is uh it's actually amazing the where all the different resistance is coming from. Uh, yesterday or the day before, the Speaker of the House of Commons in British Parliament, who um, n is normally, you know, not supposed to take a political stance on stuff, um, has said that um, if Donald Trump does come to Great Britain as part of a state visit, he does have the power to deny him the right to speak in the House of Commons, and he is going to do that. Um, because he thinks that Donald Trump runs contrary to a lot of British values. Now, hmm. um, it's kind of ironic given the fact that the ruling party in Britain, the well, the ruling coalition, the, the conservatives and the liberal Democrats, um, the conservatives are big fans of Donald Trump, at least a certain wing of them are. Um, Theresa May um, has been supportive of Donald Trump. You know, she's been... You know, critical in the in the sort of um, vanilla, milk toast way that most European world leaders are towards him. They say, "Oh, his racism and his his uh, you know bigotry are are not welcome here." But then 
you know, she sends her health secretary over to the U.S. to basically auction off their national health service to private health care companies in um, the U.S. And I don't know if you have any experience with the American health care system, but our health care companies really don't do a great job of running things. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, to, and it's... Uh, it's in light of, you know, Angela Merkel, the prime minister of Germany, who, you know, I don't really think has any kind of grounds to diss him on a on the immigration ban because yeah. for a while there she was refusing to let refugees into Germany um, and is thinking about putting a cap on the on the ref a stop on the refugees that are currently entering into Germany. That and she came out against women who wear hijabs saying that it's like a disgrace and uh, you know just right. a completely horrible practice. Um, a la uh, Francois Hollande in, yes. in um, France, who want, uh, tried to ban um, uh, headscarves for um, uh, Islamic women. And of course, it's for Islamic women. It's not, it, the, the ban not doesn't apply <laughs> right, to the numerous Catholic nuns in the very, very Catholic France. Um, no, it only applies to the uh the head coverings of uh muslim women right holland by the way uh calls himself a socialist uh he is <laughs> about as much of a socialist as obama was he's as much of a socialist as uh steve bannon is a leninist which is yeah. his new thing that he said that steve <laughs> bannon is a leninist which is really amusing because if you've ever read anything by steve bannon um he talks about uh, the global Jewish conspiracy. Uh, and then if you listen to Lenin speak about anti-Semitism, Lenin says that anti-Semites have always been and will always be the enemies of socialism. So, you know, kind of, he's, 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 uh, he's really not too well read up on his Lenin there. Nope, not at all. Um, other important things happening uh, outside of the U.S. in Russia, the parliament there voted overwhelmingly to decriminalize domestic violence mm. uh, for first offense, which is absolutely horrible. Um, you know, we can just see the complete degeneration of of Russian society post. I mean, post Stalin, really. Um, I mean, during during Stalin's rise um we we really kind of start to see it degenerate and it's just going downhill from here um yeah i think only about three people voted against this bill which now allows men who uh beat their wives once a year to only get a of a, a, a fine like a little you know slap on the wrist kind of thing right like a like a speeding ticket or like yeah. a parking ticket yeah uh and then if you beat your wife more than once a year I think the fine just increases a little bit, um, which is horrible for women around the world uh, that this precedent has been set. Um, there are lots of things that should be decriminalized. Marijuana, maybe even some prostitution, but uh, not domestic violence. Let's, let's keep that a criminal offense uh, because that affects thousands hundreds of thousands of women in the united states millions of women around the world um it's it's horrible and it just shows how deeply the patriarchy uh operates in global society right it cuts both ways by making women you know passive entities and also really um uh, promoting this sense of stoicism and aggression in men. And, you know, when those two things mix, um, a, a consequence of that is domestic violence in which, you know, men beat their wives. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're also seeing... Uh, so, I mean, the big elephant in the room was uh, Donald Trump was inaugurated uh, yeah. January 20th. Um, and there was almost immediately um, huge waves of resistance. So on January 20th, there were protests not only all over the U.S., um, but also all over the world. Um, our, <coughs> excuse me, our um, uh, 
organization here in the U.S. led a lot of protests, including here in Worcester. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But also um, all across the world, our sister organizations and the Committee for Workers International organized um, huge protests. Um, and uh, from anywhere from India uh, to uh, Nigeria to Britain, um, Germany, it was uh, really, really astounding. Hong Kong had a big demonstration. Um, it was amazing because, uh, and I think this is this is actually really important to talk about, that um, resistance against Donald Trump um, is not just a national issue. Um, it's not just that Donald Trump is, uh, his agenda is a threat to us, to us nationally, and to a certain extent, I'm not even necessarily talking about his agenda here, but... <clears throat> his um, his election has demonstrated that right wing populism uh, can can win elections. Uh, that that taking economic um, hardships and social hardships and then blaming them on you know minorities or or whatever other group you want can actually work. And that's a very dangerous thing when you have things like in Germany, AFD, uh, the alternative for Germany which is uh, a right-wing party, um, when you have in Italy, uh, you know, pe people like the, the former president Berlusconi was, he was often referred to as uh, the Italian Donald Trump. Um, you know, in uh, Great Britain, um, you have even further to the right than the conservatives, you have a lot of the people who were formerly um, big uh, UKIP people, um, uh, people like Boris Johnson, uh, Nigel Farage. In France, you have Marine Le Pen. In uh, in India, you have the Morsi presidency, and you have uh, the a lot of the far right in India um, openly acknowledging that they like Donald Trump and they wanted Donald Trump to win. And now that Donald Trump has won, they are going to be launching their own campaigns. He's emboldening the right wing all across the world. And the fact of the matter is. If we don't put up a fight, if it seems like Donald Trump can just get what he wants um, through uh, with his with his program without resistance from the people in the U.S., people like Marine Le Pen, people like the Alternative for Germany, um, people like you know the the rising far right in in uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe are going to feel emboldened. If Donald Trump can get his program passed. In the United States, why can't they do it in their countries? Um, so we really have uh, an international responsibility here um, to to fight back against Donald Trump, and I think we've we've seen that, right? Yeah. The January twentieth, um, the Women's March, which is uh, supposedly the largest protest in American history. Yep. Um, Three million people uh, went out and marched, um, and now the same organization that. Uh, led the women's march is calling for a women's general strike on international women's day which by the way is a holiday started by socialists right we could get into that yeah. in a future show i think we should do that um but so they uh you know a la the um the day without immigrants um thing in 2006 when all the all the immigrant workers in the u.s uh went on strike demonstrating how necessary they were for our society and our economy um if women walk off the job march 8th um it will be a huge huge blow because um the vast majority of women are workers yes. um and 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 i'm so, just to yeah, interrupt the vast majority of low-wage workers are women the vast majority of workers in retail industries fast food industries restaurant industries are women and if if women walk off the job you know uh i think it's going to to uh blow uh, a huge blow to to um you know just uh, people's ability to do their everyday things. How are you going to get your Big Mac if yeah. three quarters of the McDonald's staff walks off the job? Yep. Um, you know, but in, in addition to that, uh, there's been the protests, uh, the airport protests around the uh, immigrant ban. Um, you know, <laughs> don't kid yourselves. The only reason that judges stopped 
the immigration ban was because people stood up and fought back against it. If there was no resistance, why would these judges put themselves uh, up against, you know, the Trump administration? Yeah. Uh, the only reason they did that was because they knew that um, we were going to force Donald Trump's hand one way or another. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, it, lots of other stuff around the immigration ban was uh, hugely in inspirational. The French Pilots Union um, actually was refusing to fly any planes uh, to the U.S. as long as the travel ban was in effect. Yeah. Um, and if you if you think about that in terms of an economic stranglehold, um, that's that does serious, serious damage. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just talking about the ban, uh, one of my professors today said that uh, the judge in, in Seattle who struck it down, struck it down because it goes against American ideals and like American history. But I hate to break it to you. Right. 1921, I believe, there was uh, an anti-immigration bill passed. The United States has a very rich history of uh, keeping immigrants out. We can look at um, us not taking in uh, Jewish refugees during the Holocaust, or not as many as we should have. Um, us, uh, you know, putting Japanese immigrants in internment camps. Us refusing Chinese immigrants. Um, around the turn of the century, early 1900s as we well. Also, we also, a uh, little bit of hidden history, in World War One. we imprisoned uh, German immigrants as yeah. well, similar to the in internment camps um, that the Japanese Americans faced. Yeah. America is a nation of immigrants, but it's never been a nation that has been friendly to immigrants. Yes. Uh, every every successful wave or su successive wave of immigrants um, has faced a lot of the same struggles, um, and it's it's been it's always been an economic necessity for America to have immigration. That's why so many of, uh, for example, a lot of the tech companies um, out on the West Coast that build themselves as, as progressive companies, um, why so many are fighting against the immigration ban, because immigrants are always the source of cheap, the cheapest labor in America. Um, they are willing to do work um, for less money, depending on where they came from. If, if they are coming from countries that don't have uh, long histories of workers' struggles or unions, um, they are not used to the idea that you should be getting paid a decent amount of money for your work. Um, and it's, they, do, they do the jobs <clears throat> that American workers... Uh, American-born workers aren't willing to do because American-born workers know that they deserve better. Um, and these immigrants are coming in and people are saying to them, hey, you're here and you got no money, so you're going to work for next to nothing, you know, picking my fruit uh, in, in Carolina. Um, and you're going to like it because that's the only thing you can do right now. Yeah. One thing that I've seen recently is, you know, Starbucks has committed to hiring 10,000 immigrants. And, you know, my question is, OK, but how are you supposed to pay your bills while you're working for minimum wage at Starbucks? That's that's my question. Um, that's cool that they're going to have jobs, but they're going to be low-wage jobs that, you know, uh, are are usually um, relegated to, like, teenagers as, like, a, a part-time job to do during, during college, right? That's not a living wage. You would need to work, you know, maybe two Starbucks jobs to even get close to a living wage. Um, and and that's, that's part of the problem. I mean, if you think about this systematically, the whole... The whole root of anti-immigrant sentiments in the United States is when you, you know, create a group that that is, you know, societally accepted as, you know, this this, uh, you know, alien or foreign group, then automatically it opens the door to more exploitation. If if your society I views immigrants as lesser people, it opens up the door for corporations to allow them to pay them less because the society agrees that they are a lesser 
people. Um, and, and, you know, the fundamental root of all of this societal uh, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment is, you know, the fact that uh, the economy will profit off of the fact that we can pay immigrants lower than minimum wage or just plain and simple minimum wage. And, you know, they uh, will either be, you know, too scared to organize. Um, how can I ever, you know, organize a union in my workplace when I'm an illegal immigrant and drawing attention to myself could get me deported? You know, um, there's there's so much around immigrant struggles that's really just tied to exploitation. Yeah, I mean, um, the American... <laughs> the American economy and so much of, of the wealth in America was originally built on the backs of slaves. Um, and when slavery uh, passed its expiration date, um, what was the what was the new exploited workforce you were going to have? You know, there was the the huge upswing in um, unions. The the beginnings of American unions were really you know the the 1870s 1880s um, with stuff like uh, Eugene V Debs organizing the the railway men, um, and you know when you're facing uh you know in the south they they kept up slavery with sharecropping and things like that but in the north when all of your industrial workers are starting to organize and they're starting to demand more money and that money is cutting into your profits what do you do you bring in the irish you bring, you bring in, in the, the germans. germans you bring in um you know the polish the, yeah the poles later on you bring in all these new groups um that and you're right. the 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 sense the sense of of social um, I'm gonna use a word that I don't know if is real uh, mm -hmm. ostracization. Ost yeah, uh, I think that sounds right. It's it's a when your yeah. when your group is ostracized, right? It turns it turns internally. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the um, history around um, immigrant communities um, in the U.S. Uh, stuff groups like the Irish groups like the Italian um, was a history of uh, you know little Italy's little Ireland's you know immigrants went to places where all the other immigrants were and uh, being isolated being turned into this island of their own where you know the Irish are drunks they're all drunks they're all alcoholics and the you know the Italians are all lazy or whatever kind of rhetoric you have which is all rhetoric that sounds very familiar today mm. if you <clears throat> if you take the the average um gop uh congressman's argument against immigration and you just replace mexican or whatever other adjective with irish mm -hmm. uh you're going to be sounding an awful lot like you just came from you know, the late 19th, early 20th century. Yeah. And it's... I mean, same thing if you replace the word Muslim with the word Jewish, like a Jewish band. Replace, replace, the, word, replace the word Muslim with Jew and ask yourself if you sound like a Nazi. Yeah. Um, I think uh, in, in sort of the global economy that we have, one of, the, one of the things that people always question about immigration is where does it come from? And I think its roots are actually in um, the global economy, not the not inherently having an economy where all the countries are connected together, but in the fact that there are a, a small number of very powerful countries um, economically dominating the vast majority of the world. So when you look at, I mean, when you look at the Middle East, right, and you go, why are there so many you know, Arabic or, or Middle Eastern immigrants into the U.S. or into Britain or into uh, Sweden or something. Um, and this was happening even before, like, the big refugee crisis. You only have to look at what their homelands look like and look at the destroyed buildings and the lack of infrastructure and, you know, the, the lack of access to clean water. That's a result of not only European colonization, but also continued European military intervention in the area. Um, when you look at uh, the African coast or you look at um, Latin America and you say, hey, why are there so many 
um, Latin immigrants in America. And then you look at the history of the U.S. intervening in Latin America, preventing those economies from growing and becoming self-sufficient, um, then it becomes really obvious. If you artificially create a scarcity of um, opportunity in these quote-unquote third world countries, then the people who live in these third world countries have no uh, option but to go somewhere where they think there is opportunity. For example, America or Western Europe. And then they come to America or Western Europe and they work for terrible wages and they get put up against the native worker. Um, you know, if you go to any... Um, you go to any workplace in the U.S. and you tell the workers there, you tell the workers at a, a warehouse somewhere, you say, hey, I have a bunch of guys who are coming up from Central America, and they're all willing to do your job for 10 bucks less an hour, right? Those workers, first, are going to blame those immigrants. They're going to say, you know, this is their fault. Um, when you look at it, <laughs> It's really your fault for yeah. being willing to um, put these two groups into a bidding war, threatening their livelihood, um, and saying that the other group is doing the threatening. Um, it's it's classic divide and conquer tactics. Not only is it classic divide and conquer, but also it's it's the foundation. It's one of the foundational elements of capitalism. You have to have competition within the labor market. Uh, so that you can continuously right. drive the, down wages. The threat of the army of, un of the unemployed. Exactly. Be exactly. grateful for the job you have now because look at all these people who would take your job. Right. Don't ask for more or right. I might have in, to give your job away. In a system where you need, where, where a job equals survival, right? It's, it's no wonder why there are these you know racist and and xenophobic ideologies when when people's survival is being threatened you know they 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 take a very simple simple look at who's doing the threatening and they they incorrectly say oh it's the immigrants no it's your boss it's your boss who's saying oh i'm going to pay this person uh less so you should take less right um and 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 i think that this this is uh so funny because reaching full employment totally doable even bourgeois economists know how to reach full employment right the the fact that there are unemployed people and homeless people in societies today is just so absurd when there are so many jobs that need to be done like you know repairing america's crumbling infrastructure or teaching you know uh, the fact that there's unemployment is absolutely absurd, but that's a necessity of the market. You need to have unemployment uh, or else, you know, you're not going to be able to drive down wages. Um, but uh, having full employment is just as simple as decreasing the work week and increasing wages. Very simple solution. Uh, jobs programs also very simple solution to reach full, uh, full employment. Yet uh, we don't do it. And the reason we don't do it is capitalism. Right. It cuts it cuts into companies' profits, um, and that's ultimately the the root um, of our struggle against capitalism and our disagreement with capitalism is that it says survival and livelihood for people is not achievable um, with profits. Um, the two things cannot exist together. Uh, one of them has to be picked over the other. And that's not just a, a thing that, like, you know, Bill Gates wakes up every day and he says, this is how the world works. That's just what people have been trained to think um, as a natural fact of the world. And and the truth is that it's it's not. Um, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was in my economics class, we were talking about, you know, uh, the, the business cycle or something like that. And, um, you know, they were like, oh yeah, the, the, the businessman goes to the product market to buy the products with which, you know, he's going to sell stuff. And then he goes to the labor market and I'm like, hold up, hold up. So he goes, he, 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 you know, just goes around from markets to markets, like buying people 
people's like time and wages like isn't that kind of close to you know buying people um it 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 really just struck me as odd um the fact that we were trained to think of labor as the same commodity as like yarn you know we're trained to think that a human's time and a human's labor and a human's ability uh be it you know knitting or teaching or thinking or uh welding you know uh is is just as as uh you know uh simple or uh replaceable as like inanimate things when that's someone's life you're talking about right like that's a person um but you know in economics you're trained to think of someone's labor as just another commodity right uh and i think that's really the the basis of of <clears throat> why we say capitalism is inherently exploitative because it is rooted in commodification of human beings um of human energy um, and the fact is that we don't think life should be commodified. Um, so I want to, if I may, um, I want to talk about something that's been, um, a really funky thing that's been happening since Trump has been elected. Um, so in global politics, uh, you know, back in the cold war, we had a, we had a two pole world is the way they talked about it. There was the you know, the U.S. was one pole. It was one source of global power um, in the world. The U.S. with its allies in Western Europe. Um, and that the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc was the, the other source of, of global power. Um, yeah, a two-pole a two world. Um, with the collapse of the, the Soviet Union um, and the Eastern Bloc and the expansion of capitalism into those areas uh, formerly blocked off by Stalinism, um, there's been a unique, and in addition to some other things that I'm going to talk about, there's been a unique thing where f we are really moving into a tripolar world. Um, there's really three sources of, of global power in terms of countries that project um, their economic and political power into other countries. It's the United States, um, the United States doesn't have, uh, as many allies as it used to, um, during the, uh, the, um, war in, I in Iraq, uh, there was huge uproar, not only at home, but also in Europe against the war. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the country's, uh, leaders, people like Tony Blair, um, who supported the U S have, uh, you know, come down out of power and, uh, criticism of the U S for its involvement in other people's affairs is, um, pretty, pretty, uh, well accepted in Europe. Um, in Russia, Russia's the other pole still not as powerful as it used to be, um, with the loss of all of the former Soviet republics and, and people's republics. Um, but Russia still has a lot of authority. Um, a lot of the, uh, countries um, that used to be Soviet republics are still in um, the Russian sphere of influence, Ukraine being a notable exception, but uh, places like Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan um, are very much tied to the Kremlin. Um, and then you have China, and China really um, had been developing as a global power and, and separated itself from the Soviet bloc during the the Sino-Soviet uh, conflict um, in the in the middle of the Cold War, um, but they, when the global recession hit, um, they actually uh, their economy went up. Uh, their econ their economy improved. You know, not for working people, but in terms of the uh, the reliance on the world economy uh, of the of the Chinese market um, increased, and China has been. Um, pushing uh, and, and expanding its influence in the South China Sea, um, trying to uh, work its way, you know, into sort of the global global power sphere. And not to mention it's, you know, semi-colonial adventures in Tibet and right. Taiwan and, you know. And so the funky thing is that before Trump, um, with Obama and the other presidents in uh, 
the way it was set up was that we opposed Russia. Um, we opposed Russia um, not because of anything ideological anymore, but just because they were unfriendly. Um, and But that we maintain friendly relationships with China. And we maintain friendly relationships with China because of our economic ties, because so much American manufacturing is tied up in China, because so much, so many of our cheap goods come from China, um, that we were friendly with China, despite all political disagreements and things like that. Um, now, with the Trump administration in and with the rise of uh, Chinese influence in the South Asia Sea, um, or South China Sea, we now have a United States, or at least a president, who is much more friendly with Russia and much more hostile to China. All of Trump's um, talk about bringing American jobs back, which he's not going to do. He has no way to do that. There's no method to do that. He doesn't control the companies that shipped their jobs overseas except for his own obviously um but uh that talk of trying to make america economically um independent uh bring back american manufacturing um directly competes with chinese interests in addition uh the u.s has been stepping up our uh presence in the south china sea um in an effort to compete for trade in that area um in addition to oil deposits in that area um and so we have the potential of a trade war with china coming up soon china uh, china recently said um that a uh, war with the u.s was a conceivable uh scenario in the future um, you know, not as a threat or anything, but as a, like, this could happen. Um, and I think that's really, really bizarre, um, to think about, uh, a, a trade war with China. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be, um, you know, a conventional war with, like, the U.S. trying to invade China or the China trying to invade the U.S., but, it, you know, another round of proxy wars like the Cold War, another round of trade battles with embargoes and and uh, uh, negotiations and treaties um, that could only do harm to the world economy is in our future, and that's a, that's a very scary thought. Not to mention, you know... Um even bourgeois economists have been talking about the the eventual decline and crash of the Chinese economy. Um, you know, they went up during the the Great Recession, but uh, <laughs> and they've they've been crashing. The yes, thing is they just, have. Their economy is so big that right. it's you know uh, it can take a few hits. Yeah, but the they had a huge collapse of their housing market recently. Yep, and uh, this is with also um european gdp down across the board the debt crisis um going on in greece and portugal and, and spain. spain and uh yeah well uh, another thing too is you know greece is talking about a grexit um i i saw you know uh the eu and the eu economy uh is is and has been uh on very fragile ground um the american economy is also on very fragile ground uh the recovery the quote-unquote recovery from the recession uh all of that recovery has gone straight back up to the top um uh you know there there were jobs created but they're all low wage right and, and that's that's actually the fact that the jobs that were created was low wage is the root of the fact that the recovery has gone to the um to the top in America because there is nothing more profitable for American companies than low wage jobs. Yep. Um, yeah, I think, uh, we're, we're heading into, into some really, really scary times, um, in, uh, all, all across the world, uh, not just in the U S I mean, right. Mexico looks more and more like a failed state every day. Yep. Yep. Um, huge, huge, huge. Uh, people, uh, you know, uh, don't know about it because the American media really hasn't talked about it much, but there have been huge national protests in Mexico uh, around soaring gas prices. Um, absolutely huge prices. You know, the president of Mexico really only represents the interests of of uh, the the 1%. 
uh, and the cartels. Um, you know, there there really is not uh, any any government representation for working people in Mexico. Um, well, and I mean, Mexico hasn't really had full control of its country. The Mexican state hasn't had full control of their territory for a very long time. Between, I mean. The Zapatistas are really not a force um, the way they used to be, yeah. but they still control parts of Chiapas, uh, and cartels control huge sections of Mexico. Yeah. The, the, the federal army in Mexico is pretty much constantly waging a war on its own territory. Um, I think, though, that what we are seeing is with all, this, um, all these problems... Um, there was a really interesting thing where uh, in, you know, after World War II until the 1970s, um, when times were good in the U.S. and, and in um, Europe. Um, well, quote unquote good. Good. The, the best they've been. Yeah. Um, the, after that, uh, there was the beginnings of austerity and neoliberalism and you know, people would fight back, but people were also um, subject to uh, s stunning effects. People got tired of protesting. People got tired of fighting um, when there weren't organizations that could could coordinate and, and lead these fights. Um, it was just inevitable that protesters would get burnt out. Um, and really, it's the, the most recent example of that and, and events messing with resistance was um the globalization protest in um at the turn of the century in 1999-2000 um where the fact that capitalism had reached the fullest extent covered every corner of the globe um and had nowhere left left to go um things started to go bad again and uh uh, a lot of the economy went down. That was the age of a lot of the first big free trade deals um, in the in the modern sense. And people were mad. People yeah. were pissed. And there were huge protests. And then 9-11 happened. Yep. And there was this huge stunning effect. 9-11 happened and every American was a patriot again. Yeah. And the protests stopped. Yep. And... Then the wars happened, and the anti-war movement kicked off. But again, without guiding organizations, you know, we're still in Afghanistan and Iraq, but you don't see the mass protests that were happening as we invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and so, but now, we had Occupy. You know, we had the crash in 2008, and Occupy didn't really kick off until 2011. Right. And Occupy wasn't just a solo thing in America. It was part of a global phenomenon. 2011 was also the year that the Arab Spring started. Um, and there was this mass fight back and this language of uh, the 99%, the 1%, a, a crude understanding of, of the fact that there are two classes in America and the world um, and that these classes have inherently separate interests you can't satisfy both of them um was really a turning point and now we're going into another period where the global economy is on chicken legs um everything is going downhill um there is you know there's no next round of brick countries developing economies that are going to ride out the the global downturn um with with improved economies you know demonstrating some hope in the future of capitalism we are really at a point where people are still mad people are still in the occupy mood and there is going to be a huge huge resistance coming in the next uh few years and yes. i think it's really the ideas of socialism are on the rise again. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, one really important thing, too, is we, we have to kind of make a balance sheet of who who are our friends in this fight, you know? Who are our friends in, in, in this fight against the 1%, against the people whose uh, class interests are diametrically opposed to ours, you know? The Democratic Party, uh, there, there, there was not one Democratic Party politician who voted against all of Trump's nominees. None. 
that is the quote unquote resistance, right? Democrats and Republicans are, you know, there's this conception that they are uh, against each other, but they're part of a duopoly. They work off of each other um, to make sure that the people who support them, the 1%, get what they want. The Democrats even said that they might step down uh, any kind of fight against whoever Donald Trump proposes for um, Supreme Court. Right. Yep. This is this is something that everybody I knew was worried about. Uh, the potential of a Trump presidency was who he was going to put in the seat uh, that <laughs> Scalia left when he died. Let's uh, remember that that was a good thing that happened in 2016. Um, but now the Democrats aren't even willing to to offer a tokenistic fight about this. They right. they've never been. Um, you know, you can go back, you can go back to even Jimmy Carter, um, as the, the Democrats were the party that introduced neoliberalism. They were the party that started cutting welfare, that started cutting social spending, um, way back with, with Jimmy Carter. And, uh, yet they somehow always managed to, to get away with it. There was this great video that I saw and it was Bill Clinton giving a speech about immigration and... He sounded exactly like Trump. He sounded exactly like Trump. He said, oh, you know, these aliens come in and they have to, you know, we need to restrict immigration because they don't follow the rules and, you know, all this other completely anti-immigrant stuff. And, you know, Bill Clinton is like the poster child of the Democratic Party. Um, we don't need that, right? We don't need xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiments being uh uh you know put forward um that's not going to help the movement what's going to help the movement is people organizing independently of the two parties of big business right i think um, even more specifically uh, nancy pelosi was just asked about whether or not the democrats would shift their economic policy in light of them losing blowing the biggest lead uh that they've ever had with the the election um with hillary clinton losing to donald trump um this student asked nancy pelosi who's a very powerful very well-known democrat you know hey people don't like the idea of capitalism anymore the vast majority of young people don't think capitalism works you know are the democrats going to shift their policies and and be more like bernie sanders she said straight up we're capitalists um and that's the way it's always been um and People really need to um, get over this myth that the Democrats are anything but capitalists or, or will right. ever act as anything but capitalists. Right. I think the future of the, the struggle for economic and racial justice in America is going to have to come outside of the Democratic Party because every single time there has been a big, a big mass movement for economic justice, for racial justice, um, for peace uh, in America, it's always made the mistake of going into the Democratic Party and now yeah. look at where we are today. Yeah. Um, it's like taking all of your energy and just shoving it right into a brick wall. Honestly, you uh, think about think about like the civil rights movement, for example. Think of all that we could have achieved, you know, uh, right up until uh, tor toward the end of Martin Luther King's life. Um, he, he was really starting to uh, uh, talk about, you know, how capitalism is uh oppressive not only to black people but also to white people um he was really starting to campaign not just on civil rights for black people but on economic rights for all americans um and you know uh he, we, we we see that this energy has recently gone into the democratic party and what have they done they have stood by well they have either stood by or initiated complete dismantling of of the uh civil rights legislation state by state if pushing the democrats to the left worked yeah why would they have run hillary clinton Boom. um if let's think about the biggest if we had to pick the two biggest mass movements in the 20th century in american history i would say it was the struggle for civil rights and it was the anti-vietnam war movement 
Those two movements were humongous, bigger than anything we're seeing today, right? Very much better organized than the the than what we're seeing today. If those organizations, those groups, those movements, with all their force, pushed into the Democratic Party, pushed back against the line of the Democratic Party, how come that has never been reflected in Democratic policy and Democratic politicians? Why has that... There has never been a change, despite all that organization, all that power, all that strength pushing for that change. And I think it, it's because the Democratic Party is inherently undemocratic. It is yeah. set up, and I don't, I don't really know how better to explain it to Americans than how the Democratic Party themselves have explained it to people. Um, What's her face? Debbie Wasserman Schultz said straight up during the primary, the superdelegate system is constructed to make sure that the Democratic Party um, does not have to be beholden to a, a grassroots movement, yeah. um, that the Democratic Party can continue to operate regardless of what kinds of forces try to enter within it. Yep. And she, Just, she said that straight up. Yep. And yet there are people. There's the Democratic Socialists of America. There's the Working Families Party. There's Bernie Sanders. There's, there's our revolution. Our revolution that are continuing to try to do this. Um, and it's astounding to me because when we look at the greatest victories in the, in the 21st century for American workers, they have come from independent politics. Yep. When we look at the $15 an hour minimum wage, that was a campaign initiated by our organization and socialist alternative in Seattle by our congresswoman or our, our councilwoman out in Seattle who won election, not as a Democrat, but as an open socialist. Um, when we look at uh, other victories we've had in Seattle, $30 million dollars for new affordable housing, um, fighting on rent control, um, you... Columbus Day changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. Right. This, these are not, these were victories that were won up against the entire Democratic Party in Seattle because yeah. they are the only party in Seattle. Also, most recently, um, we are, uh, uh trying and i believe have succeeded in getting this maybe not yet succeeded but hopefully will succeed in getting the city of seattle oh, yeah. to divest from the dakota access pipeline the um, final the final vote for that is happening today oh um, seattle right now has a lot of money seattle's a very wealthy city has yes, a is. lot of money um invested in wells fargo which is one of the biggest banks funding the um, Dapple pipeline the dakota access pipeline and we got the uh preliminary vote through um and it was unanimous that seattle should uh re remove all of its money from wells fargo yep. and invest it somewhere else yep. and uh that is not something that Democrats initiated. No. That is something that Democrats actually worked to mitigate the effects of. And they, opposed they took, outright. They took our bill and they worked on it and they made um, they made it softer. They made it friendlier to Wells Fargo. They, they changed the language and how this thing would actually happen um, against what the Seattle people want. Um, and I think... Looking forward, we need to look at the examples of Shama Sawant in Seattle, and we need to say that, just like with Occupy, that we need independent politicians running all across the country, um, people who are running without corporate money, people who are running on issues like 15, like affordable housing, like free health care. People like Ginger Jensen, <laughs> who wow, you're we, good. I know, right? Um, Ginger Jensen is one of our members who is currently running for a city council position in Minneapolis. She just recently announced her campaign. Um, you know, if, if we get another socialist elected to a city council, just look at what Shama's been able to do in Seattle. Uh, that could be Minneapolis. Minneapolis could get 15. Minneapolis could get rent control. Um, that That is the power of independent organizing. Um, and I think, you know, we, we do have to wrap up. But I think, you know, just closing thoughts, we are seeing huge, systematic, global problems 
And the, the capitalist system offers no solution. The Democrats offer no solution. The, the, the solution is going to come from the people. The solution is going to be the interest of the 99%. Um, you know, we have been systematically oppressed and exploited for far too long. And I think that it's, it's time to really come together um, as, as a united front uh, on the left and really demand things that will improve our livelihood, if not now, when? I th yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Change, you know, has to start somewhere. And I think also we're seeing not only these global systematic problems um, and crises, but we're also seeing that the people who are fighting the hardest against these are people on the left. Um, people like Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, uh, people like uh, Die Linke in Germany, you know, where the Christian Democrats have completely failed um, to stop the the alternative for Germany, um, where their, their centrism consistently fails to undercut the support, um, the right-wing support of uh, the alternative for Germany. Um, anywhere you look, the people that are fighting the hardest um, on these issues are outside of the establishment, um, whether it's here in the U.S., uh, us and other groups, whether it's Britain, um, whether it's Germany, whether it's India, um, all around the world, there is huge resistance. And I think that the last thing we can do, the, the worst thing we could do right now is be our own enemies. The worst things we could do right now is convince ourselves that all is uh lost all is all is hopeless because we are seeing mass mobilizations on a scale that we haven't seen uh for a very very long time and that in of itself um is is cause for um hope uh if if organizations uh arise from this um if experienced leaders come out of this um if people really get involved um this can all be changed um so i think that's what we have to take with us as we move forward yeah so with just that you know if if you like what we have to say if you like our ideas definitely check us out on facebook uh worcester socialist alternative radio also worcester socialist alternative like us on facebook um and consider joining us in in the fight against trump and the fight against capitalism absolutely so uh just to close i'd like to read off some of the points from our program what we stand for uh we uh, fight for these issues on all available fronts, and we do not back down on any of these issues. We fight for the 99%. We fight for environmental sustainability. We fight for equal rights for all. We fight for money for jobs and education, not war. We fight to break with the two parties of big business, and we fight for socialism, and we fight for internationalism. So thank you, Worcester State, for listening. Um, we will be on air again at this time uh, next, next week. week. Um, if you see us around campus, um, we're, uh, our office is in the Center for Human Rights on the third floor of Sullivan. Um, stop by, say hi sometimes, uh, engage us in debate if you've, yeah. got, <laughs> if you've got disagreements. We love debates. Yep. So uh, thank you all. We'll see you next week. Bye.